Welcome to lesson three for Seattle Public Schools Math 8. Today we're going to be talking about proportionality and linearity. Thank you to Ms. Hugh and Ms. Burke for helping me make this video. What you'll need at home are three things. First of all, something to write on. A piece of paper, a composition book would be great. Something to write with, pencil or pen. It would be also great if you had your Pearson workbook, because the lesson today is based off of lessons in that workbook. If you don't have it, you can also go to pearsonrealize.com. If you have none of those things, that's okay. Just join us, watch and listen best you can. For your do now today, we're gonna to estimate the distance between this start line here on the race my kids run in this video to this finish line way over here. Now remember though, what's tricky is as you're trying to figure out this distance, remember that the further away something is, the smaller it gets. Use clues from the picture. We've got a car over here you can compare. We have a low that you can think of, like it's no less than this amount. Think of a high, it's no more than this amount. And then your estimate should be in between those two, low and high. Our lesson today is gonna to be based off of our Pearson lessons 27 through 29 in your book or on pearsonrealize.com. By the end of the lesson, you are gonna learn about y equals mx, a linear or proportional relationship. You are also going to understand the y-intercept of a linear equation and write an equation for a linear relationship in the form of y equals mx plus b. Based on our three Pearson lessons today, we have three learning targets. First of all, you are going to, by the end of this video, know how to write an equation to describe a linear relationship. You're also going to look a little more deeply at the y-intercept on a graph and explain what it means is a really important part, and that depends on the situation you're describing with your linear relationship. But it always is going to be at the same place on that graph. Finally, you are going to write an equation, y equals mx plus b, based off of what you hear in the stories today. In order to explain what proportional relationship is versus a linear relationship, we're gonna start off with a video I took in my alleyway. I'm going to show my son Liam running from a start line to a finish line. We're going to be looking at his rate, which is distance over time. So I had to take those two measurements in order to find a relationship between them. And we're going to show that this relationship is proportional. So here are some things you're going to see in this video. There is a start line. The start line is in chalk right here. He can see it a little better than you can in this video. So he's going to run across the start line, and when he hits that start line, we're going to call that zero seconds of the race. And then he's going to hit this finish line way over here, and we're going to figure out what time it took him to get to that finish line. Now, distance over time is a rate, so we'll know the distance because I pre-measured from the start to the finish. But in order to make the time measurement, I'm going to look at the video and we'll show when he ran over the start line. Then we'll look at when he finished and we'll see how long it took him to find his rate. Let's take a look. So to show that this relationship is proportional, let's show those measurements that we were talking about. He ran over this start line right here one second into the video. So we're gonna call one second his start. And then he crossed the finish line right here at five seconds. That's his finish. So in order to find his rate, we need to look at his distance over time. So the distance he ran is going to be from the start line here all the way to the finish line over here. And I pre-measured. You can't see it in the video very well. I apologize for that. But I did mark along There's a rope going this whole distance and we showed in chalk every five feet. So it was 36 feet. So to find his rate or his slope in this case, we need to figure out what his change in Y over change in X would be what his constant rate was. So we need to find out his change in y, which we'll show what this looks like on a graph. His y is going to be his distance. 
So change in y is change in distance, and his x is going to be his time. So his change in x is going to be his change in time. So we have to graph what it looked like when he ran. So we're going to say for this video that his start of the race, I know he started in the video at one second and he finished at five seconds, but we're just going to say the start of the race was when he crossed that finish line, or sorry, when he crossed the start line. So let's call that time zero. Start of the race is going to be time zero. So here we're going to put zero on our graph, zero time here, and we're going to put a point on the graph to represent how far he'd made it at the start of the race, which is time zero. So at zero seconds, he had not made it any distance at all. He had just put that foot on the start line. So distance is zero when time is zero. While we're making this graph, we're also going to make a table to keep track. So time was zero and distance was also zero. His toe was on the start line. Then at the end of the race, he went one second to five seconds. That was how long it took him on the video. So that is a plus four seconds. So from now, remember, we're not putting one second on our table here. Zero means the start of the race. That's when I started my clock when I said, okay, race starts. So at four seconds into the video, he had gone how far? Well, zero seconds, zero feet. By the time he hit four seconds, he'd gone 36 feet. So 36 feet on our table. So if we want to figure out his rate, we have to do a division or a comparison of his distance over time. So to figure that out, we're going to do some quick math here. We're going to say, what is his change in time and his change in distance? So his change in distance, we're going to put change in distance and we're going to put change in time. In order to find his change in distance, we have to say from zero feet to 36 feet is how much change. From zero to 36 is plus 36 feet. His change in distance is 36, and his change in time from zero to four is plus four. So now we can write his rate. His rate was change in distance over change in time. His change in distance was 36 feet, and his change in time is four seconds. That is his rate, how fast he is running. Now I told him to run at a constant speed, which means he does not slow down or speed up the entire time. So that tells us that every single point on that line from start to finish, he's going the same exact speed the whole way. So we can graph that. We have zero, zero, that is the first point on our graph, zero times zero distance. And the second point that we took data on was when he had run four seconds, which was 36 feet. So I'm gonna go, uh, let's go four seconds here. And so halfway is two and half of that is one and halfway between two and four is three. So at four seconds, which is here, let's put distance, let's put 36 here. So halfway would be 18 and halfway would be nine. And then counting by nines, whoops, 9, 18, 27 is here. So at four seconds, 36 feet was run. So we now have two points on our graph. We have 436 and we have 0, 0. Now we can say because he's running at a constant speed that I can measure his distance anywhere along this time interval from zero to four because he never changes his speed. So if I were to pause that video at two seconds, 
how long would he have run? How far would he have run? So I'm going to put two on our table. So think about it. If he went 36 feet in four seconds and he never changed his speed, how many feet would he run after two seconds? So the great thing about a proportional relationship is that there is a constant speed, a straight line, and that the graph goes through the origin, zero, zero. That means that every point on this line is proportional. So if I go half the speed, I would go half the distance. That would mean two seconds, I've gone 18 feet. I can keep going, find one second, and I would assume that he would have gone nine feet. So proportional relationships are a straight line through the origin and they represent a constant rate. So I could keep this line going, draw a straight line and do an arrow to say that if he were to continue running at the same rate, we could continue finding points along this line to represent how far he would go. Now in real life, would Liam be able to run at a constant rate forever with that infinite line going forever? No. But on small intervals of time, maybe for 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, he could run at a constant rate. So that is a proportional relationship. I can write an equation for that that could represent any distance and any time using this form. I could say y, which is his distance, always equals his rate multiplied by time. So I have his rate. I'm going to call that m, his slope or his rate, multiplied by x, his time. Let me show you what that would look like. We're going to take his rate here, 36 over 4. And we're going to say y, his distance, equals 36 over 4 multiplied by x. And the reason this works is because if you look at this, 36 over 4, that can reduce. 36 divided by 4 is 9. 9 feet per 1 second. And we show that in our graph. This is why this equation works. There's 9 feet that he runs for every 1 second. He can go 9 more feet for every 1 second. That is his slope. Plus 9 feet for every plus 1 second. And that is a constant rate. It's going to make that straight line. Every nine more feet, he's going to run one more second. Nine more feet, one more second. That is called a slope triangle. In this case, his rate is his slope. Change in y over change in x. Change in y is his distance. Change in x is his time. So I could use that equation. What if he ran? I don't know, five seconds. Nine feet per second times five seconds would be 45 feet. What if we ran for 10 seconds? Nine feet per second times 10 seconds would be 90 feet. So that equation is super useful. I can now calculate his distance for any time. So that is a proportional relationship. A proportional relationship is a straight line that has a point that goes through the origin the origin is 0, 0, and it represents a constant rate. We drew a table, we made a graph, and we wrote an equation. And all three of those things represent the same thing. They represent his distance over time or his speed for any distance and any time. Let's take a look at a linear relationship. The last situation was proportional. Liam was running at a constant rate, making a straight line on the graph. He had a starting value at zero seconds, zero feet. That is a proportional situation. I'm about to show you a situation that is not proportional. It is linear. Linear relationships still have a straight line, constant rate, but they don't have a starting value always at zero, zero. In this case, we have my two kids are saving money. Nina here has a jar of money so far that we've counted. And we know that she has $36. And then Liam has a jar of money that he's counted and he's saved up, and he has $32.
So we can show here the linear relationship that would exist over time. If they want to save money, that would be an increasing linear relationship. And if they wanted to spend money, that would be a decreasing linear relationship. So let's say one of my children decides to save money and the other child decides to spend their money. Let's see what that would look like on a graph. So Nina, let's say she wants to spend money. So that would mean this is number of weeks and this would be the amount of money they have in their jar. So if Nina's gonna spend money, let's say that she buys little things here and there and she spends at a fairly constant rate. Let's say that she spends $4 a week. So she's gonna start off with X and Y on her table and she at zero weeks at the start of this comparison of the two of my kids, she starts with $36 in her little bank. And Liam has a starting value at zero weeks, the start of their comparison of spending. Zero weeks, he has $32 in that bank. So Nina, after one week, she's spending about $4. So that means that as time increases by one week, her amount of money decreases by $4. 36 minus four is 32. If she continues at a constant rate, that would mean for every one more week that goes by, plus one, change in X is one, she would reduce the amount of money or go down by $4. Now she's got $28. She could continue reducing her amount of money every week at a constant rate. And it would look like this. After one week, she's reduced from 36 to 32. My graph is counting by fours on the y-axis, by the way. So that would mean she now has one week gone by, she has $32. Another week goes by, she now, I can see in my table, has $28. So there is two weeks have gone by and she now has $28. If I were to connect those with a straight line, doing my best I can with the drawing app I'm using, I would see that she would continue to decrease in money, decrease, 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 until eventually she'd run out of money. So that would be some number of weeks. I can count here and see that's nine weeks. She'd end up with $0. Now that makes sense because her rate of spending, her slope, is her change in Y or money over change in X or time. She changed her money by $4, negative four, she spent it for every one week. That would mean her equation would be the amount of money she has is going to be how fast she's spending it, the rate, which is negative $4 per week, multiplied by the number of weeks that go by, plus she started with $36. So her y-intercept should be 36. I could test this equation at any point on my line. Let's say I looked at four weeks. If I put four weeks into my equation, negative $4 a week times four is negative 16. Negative $16 is what she spent, plus 36, negative 16 plus 36, that's 20. So I can look here on my graph and sure enough, yeah, there's 20. So the, her line is a negative slope. Her slope is negative because she's spending money. Now Liam decides to save money. So he's gonna have positive slope. His graph will be increasing. So on his table, we would say, after one week, Liam decided to do um, stickers on his chore chart to make some money. So he ends up with, now this is an old one, it's just an example. So don't worry about how many are on here, it's just what it looks like. Let's see, let's say that he saved um, $8 a week. Let's say he's doing enough stamps on that chore chart that he's saving $8 a week. So for change in X, one week, he's gonna save $8. So eight plus 32 that he already had is $40. Now if he continued saving at the same rate, his graph would be increasing over number of weeks. The more he saved, the higher his graph goes because his amount of money is increasing over time. So I'm gonna go one more week. 
eight more dollars, he now has $48 for two weeks. Let's graph that and see what it looks like. He started with less money than Nina did. He started at 0.32, but he gets $8 more after one week. So I'm gonna show one week goes by and he gets four, eight more dollars when my graph's counting by fours. So this is one week has gone by and he has saved a total of $40. Another week goes by, one more week, he's now at two weeks and he has eight more dollars, he's now at 48. Two weeks, he's now at $48. Notice that he also has a straight line because he's saving at a constant rate, but his straight line is increasing because his linear relationship is positive slope. So his equation would look like this. The amount of money Liam has is the same situation as Nina. We still have a rate and a starting value, but his rate is positive. He has a rate of plus $8 per week multiplied by the number of weeks plus however much he started with. He started with 32. He has positive slope because his change in his amount of money over change in time was positive $8 per week. So he has a slope triangle that goes positive eight over positive one, $8 per one week. Nina had a negative slope triangle. She had negative $4, she spent $4 for every one week. So this is a linear relationship. It has a y-intercept. Here is Nina's y-intercept in her equation. Here is her y-intercept in her table. And here is her y-intercept on her graph. Liam's got the same thing. He's got a y-intercept in his table. He's got a y-intercept on his graph. And he has a y-intercept in his equation. They also have a slope. Nina had a negative slope because her graph was decreasing over time, and Liam has a positive slope because his graph was increasing over time. Let's do a quick summary about what we learned today. We learned that a proportional relationship has a constant rate, which in this case is m, and you can show that with a slope triangle, which is the change between two points. A proportional relationship goes through the origin, and it makes a straight line. We also talked about a y-intercept, which is always where x is zero. In this case, we have a y-intercept that's positive, and in this case, a y-intercept that's negative. We also talked about the equation y equals mx plus b is a linear relationship. It has a constant rate of change or slope and a y-intercept that sometimes is zero, but not always. Now that we've gone through our lesson from 2.7 to 2.9 in Pearson, you can go ahead and practice by going to any school site and picking up a packet that says middle school math grade eight. Here's the one from last week, April 6th. Or you can go to your Pearson workbook or Pearson online and do lessons 2.7 to 2.9. For your do now today, there's really nothing to reveal because during the video, I already said that it was 36 feet from the start to the finish. So if you were listening carefully, you realized you already know the answer to our do now. Finally, for our exit ticket today, last week we had this, which one doesn't belong, that shows three quantity x plus two, x minus one, x squared, and four minus two y. Here were some submissions of which one doesn't belong from last week. Of course, they all don't belong in some way, someone says. Number one doesn't belong because it's the only one that you can use distributive property, three times x and three plus, or three times two. Um, number three, because it has an exponent. Number four doesn't belong. It's the only one that has the variable y. Number two doesn't belong. It's the only one with a subtracted term. And number four does not have an x term. For this week, take a look at the four we have over here. Number one, two, three, and four, those are all graphs. Some may have a connection to what we did today about proportional relationships and linear relationships. You can go ahead and send in your submission to the phone number 971-238-4109 and we'll see if we'll put it in next week's video.